Fadi, it's a pleasure as always. Um, we have a session now where we've been asked to talk about investing in the future, an outlook of investing in the next 10 years here in the MENA region, and what we think needs to happen and what, what are the opportunities that may exist in this space uh, moving forwards. Just to put a little bit of context before we jump into that, um, based on our data, 2010, 15 venture-backed investments in the region amounting to $35 million worth of investment. Fast forward 20 years, 2020, thus far, 425 deals with 850 million of investment in venture funding. And when you looked at the countries, I guess back then you'd know a lot better than me, Jordan, Lebanon leading the way. Now you have the big U UAE, KSA, Egypt ecosystems uh, leading in the region. And interestingly, when you look at it from an industry perspective, it was e-commerce, transport and logistics. Ironically, especially in the midst of COVID, there's still e-commerce, transport and logistics, but many other industries also seeing a rise of investment. So of course, yourself, the patriarch, executive chairman of Wamba Capital, um, the godfather, as I always reference you as the person that's experienced the last 10 years, no better person to really kind of look at what the landscape may look like in the next 10 years. And um, bear with me as I take a typical kind of consulting approach of a SWOT analysis. If we look back historically and we look forwards uh, predictively with our crystal ball, how would you kind of characterize the key strengths as three key characteristics of the strengths of the ecosystem in MENA um, for the next 10 years? Thank you, Philip. It's uh, such a pleasure uh, to be with you as always. Um, look, uh, strengths and, and threats, uh, I would uh, put them in the same category in the region because the opportunity here uh, is, is massive. Look, this is a huge market. It has about 400 million people, depending on which countries you add to the MENA region. Uh, they're all young, they're all connected, they all transact, uh, they're all, a lot of them are digital first. So the market potential is huge. Now, the opportunity here is it's really untapped. I mean, it's five years old if you want to look at it. I mean, for those my age, you know, from the very early days of the first dot-com boom back in 2000 and, and, and the late 90s, uh, there were two or three digital companies in the region, if you want to call them that, the internet companies. Today, it is, it's all over the place. And um, it's built up in the past five years. So everybody is aware, everybody is, is engaged. So the opportunity is huge. So there is a market. But the threat in that market, if you want, is, is that it's also fragmented. Uh, uh, another opportunity here, if you want to uh, talk about strength, is that there is, uh, uh, there is more capital coming into the market. I mean, it's, uh, it's not as much as you want, we want, but uh, as you had mentioned, there's much more coming into the market and there is a thirst for it because because this is early stage, because you're building uh, from the very early stage, so that the, the, the strength here is whoever is, is starting now is going to see the benefits of the companies that are actually building the ecosystem and the infrastructure of the digital economy here. So, so I mean, there, there is, I mean, it's, it's never a straightforward story here. So what, uh, what's, what's strength and what's weakness uh, uh, or what's an opportunity uh, or a challenge are, are one and the same. It depends on how you are going to take advantage of them on the ground and make them happen. I guess, I mean, like one way to also look at it is you're looking at this from an asset class perspective as an investor. 10 years ago, it wasn't necessarily considered an asset class. And we know that historically investors in the region are more kind of used to investing in real estate, difficult term deposits, even the stock market uh, is an asset class that is competitor to venture. Now we're seeing people begin to get into this, although COVID has potentially impact the, 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 the growth to date. Um, 10 years into the future, what needs to kind of catalyze or spark further investments from an opportunity perspective um, for us to see more venture capital investment here in the region? Or is it patience? 
patience you said did you say patience at the end yeah patience, no, patience yeah. is essential because what you know in in this business uh, uh if you look at it wherever uh, you look at it globally uh, patience is key uh, i mean there is no overnight uh, uh, uh big bucks being made here what uh, uh, the whole industry globally not only in the region to be fair so patience uh, venture is patient capital and 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 you need to be very patient even more in the markets that are early, uh, like ours. Uh, 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 but the biggest two things that need to happen, uh, Philip, so that we can realize our potential. One is governments in the region need to understand if they want to create and build the digital economy, they need to open their markets to each other. This market needs to become one big market called the MENA market, meaning the ease of movement of people, goods, capital, companies, uh, uh, and talent. I mean, you need to have that ease. You need to think EU opening up to each other so that you can have that big market, which means if I start a business in Amman, Jordan, I am able to tap into the full MENA market anytime I want, or in Dubai, or in Riyadh, or in, uh, in, in Tunis. So if we don't do that, the fragmentation of the market is going to make it very difficult to scale businesses of, of, of significant size. You'll continue to have companies. There is potential. There's no question about it. But will they be at the full size that they can be? Will they look like a Kareem or a Souk? Uh, uh, to actually become sort of unicorns or, or employing tens of thousands of people, it will take much longer. You have to be much more patient in a smaller, more fragmented market. And, and, and it's, you're not going to realize uh, the potential as, as, uh, uh, of the size uh, that other, others have done because it becomes so difficult and so much friction uh, in this. Coupled with that, and this is how you get capital, by the way. Capital comes where the market is because you're competing for dollars that can go anywhere, right? It can go to Southeast Asia, it can go to Silicon Valley, it can go to Europe. If you want your, if you want global capital and even local capital to stay and invest here or come here, you have to show them that there is size. Coupled with that, coupled with that, is a regulatory environment that is extremely engaging. I'm not saying that you need to go out of your way to do things that are not done other, in other places of the world. But the regulators in the region need to finally understand that this is such an important market and to build the digital economy and to move away from uh, the oil-based economy because all the politicians and all the, the government officials in the region say, we want to build the digital economy of, of, uh, of the region. Then you need to have an engaged, uh, uh, regulator, meaning uh, uh, they need to start talking to startups. They need to start benchmarking against global players and global governments and, and how they are actually uh, addressing the challenges of fintech, let's say. You know, there is a massive potential of fintech in the region because we are an under a banked region. Uh, you know, the region is yep. probably one of the most underbanked regions of the world. So the potential of bringing people into the financial system can only happen digitally. Nobody wants to go to a bank now to bank or to do anything for that matter. So the regulators, and I mean by that the central banks, not offshore regulators, central banks need to engage and need to be part of that discussion so that we can open up the market and there is an interoperability. So this is not only about the UAE or Saudi Arabia engaging. This is about central banks talking to each other across the region so that they can actually have people uh, operate under one regulatory regime so that if I am in Dubai, like a passporting system. So if I'm in Dubai or I'm in Riyadh or I am in Bahrain, I can actually transact digitally, financially, without having to uh, set up a different set of operations in each country. It will cost you more and it will take so much more time to actually build it.
And do you think that's possible? And how far are, off are we? I mean, is that a realistic yeah, dream I mean, that we can... You tell me what for? the future needs to be done. It's, it's possible. Yes, it's possible. Why not? I mean, it's, it's done in many other places of the world. Why, why are we so different? I don't understand. There's no difference between us and the rest of the world. We just need to understand what the future of our eco economies require. And we need to have a, 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 an ecosystem a stakeholder engagement. We need everyone to be part of the discussion. Government, private sector, uh, entrepreneurs, capital providers, uh, regulators, they need to have a serious discussion and say, how are we going to solve the problems of the region of uh, creating new jobs, uh, moving away from, uh, from the oil-based uh, economies, uh, you know, creating new wealth, they, these, these happen because you need to build the infrastructure for them. And that infrastructure, a, a big part of it, is the regulatory side. And so, but one also, if we're looking 10-year horizon, that, that, that gives us, in this discussion, the luxury of not being short-termist and a little bit more long-termist. Clearly, if you're a government, there is also an investment that needs to happen now to see returns in 10 years, whether it be research and development, whether it be in uh, education, whether it be in coding, and etc. I mean, where are your views on what investment that may not give a KPI return in the next 12 months that needs to be done now to see this continue to grow in the future, given that many founders historically to date have been uh, consultant or, 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 or uh, entrepreneurs that are solving for pain points and infrastructure solutions uh, now, rather than potentially developed products for the future to compete on a global level. Well, you know, you're, you're, uh, you go to the, the, the classical answer that I'm going to give you. It's, it's all about education. How are you going to be, build the digital generation, right? Everybody is digital now. So the kids that are going to school, whether governments uh, enable them or not, are already digital. That's all they do. They're, yeah. they're on their phones. Uh, they don't even think of laptops, you know. <laughs> they're, they're, everything happens on a mobile, uh, right? So. Yeah. Uh, how do we build that? How does government build that infrastructure of knowledge and that uh, uh, connectivity infrastructure so that it becomes ubiquitous and it becomes very cheap for people to be connected? You cannot have a digital divide. You cannot have the, the digitally haves versus the digitally have nots because COVID taught us something that when, when suddenly our education system goes online, it is those that can afford to be digitally online that are going to be able to access knowledge. And those that are digitally not able to access knowledge, uh, to access uh, because of cost and because of infrastructure, then they're gonna be lagging behind. So are we gonna have a society of haves and have nots that continue in the digital uh, 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 economy? Or are we going to have a completely connected uh, uh, and the promise uh, of the digital economy of being open and accessible? Because that's the original promise, right, of the internet, yep. is that everybody accesses knowledge. But if, if, if governments do not build over the long term an affordable broadband that is available for every citizen, then you're going to have uh, people left behind. And when people are left behind, you continue to have the same problems that you had in the 20th century. And so nothing is resolved. So how do we view the digital enablement as an opportunity? Rather, because government needs to do that. So government is the most patient investor, is the most, is, is, they think differently than, than us investors. They, their, their, their returns are not only financial, but they're societal. So combining both, building that digital infrastructure, and we see it, we see it here in the UAE, we see it here in Dubai, uh, uh, it is already happening, but uh, uh, the whole region need, needs to be part of that because the talent pool in the region, if we don't want it to leave, if we don't want it to go and find opportunities somewhere else, and if you want uh, you know, the interchangeability of labor moving from one city to the other in the region, then we have to create that sort of uh, level uh, playing field where everybody accesses knowledge and knowledge is available online at all times. I, I think that's the most crucial element to answer, to answer the question that came out very recently in the Arab Youth Survey. So the Arab Youth Survey came out with that, if you know, uh, if you remember just a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, Philip, and it basically said 
uh, when they asked uh, these young kids that are graduating from college, they said they want to immigrate. I mean, how terrible yep. is that? How terrible is yep. it that you're going to lose your talent? Or if our talent is going outside to study outside of this region, then they don't want to come back. Yeah. And that is well, I, I, I think it's an interesting time now. Well, with COVID, what's quite interesting is because of the restriction of travel, now is, I mean, there's so many challenges with COVID, obviously, but with that, there's an opportunity now to really hone in people here in the region to keep them here. I mean, because yeah, actually in the Middle East- the right reasons, Philip. You have to keep them for the right reasons. That's true. Not because they're stuck. But you can develop those reasons. An opportunity. But you can use, yeah, but you can use now to build those opportunities for them. I mean, it, now more than ever before, people are seeing opportunities to create businesses. But the question is, how can you incentivize them? I mean, ultimately, okay. how do you keep them here um, so okay. that they want to build? Um, just when we talk about kind of key, key stakeholders and protagonists, let's talk about the investor mindset. Um, obviously, we need to see more capital. And if we can just characterize them as angel investors, VC investors, or, or institutional investors, and then international investors, all three of them need to grow over the next 10 years to see growth in the ecosystem. Starting with angel investors, what can be done now to support more growth of angel investors in the ecosystem uh, to make them more incentivized to kind of support early stage companies in the region? Look, the best way to show angel investors is that, uh, that this is something that they should do uh, beyond uh, supporting the e ecosystem. I mean, you want them to be uh, convinced in, in investing and uh, expecting Correct. a return. So, uh, showing that there is there is a market for it. Uh, you are going to invest and you are going to make money. Let me tell you something, uh, Philip, that people don't talk much about because you and I in our own fields will not cover so much what angel investors get in their exits. I mean, I think there should be a study on this because a lot of angel investing and a lot of early stage investors are doing secondaries. They are making money. Yeah. One once you do an, a B round, companies are the, the early, uh, very early investors are making lots of money. Uh, I mean, I don't know if uh, if the Kareem uh, angel investors want to talk, but these are people for you to. I was going. I was going to say, you, you 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 give me the details and the data. I'll do the survey. And 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 I'll tell you, they they uh, there there were a lot of people that made a bundle of money on the Kareem deal. Yes, okay, so it's one deal. But I, I tell you from the from the investments that we've done over over the years, is that a lot of angels exit. So there is money to be made. You need to you need to educate them. Uh, our friends at Venture Soup do a lot of work on on educating uh, early stage and angel investors, and I think it's essential. You need to show them that this is an asset class. It's yes, it could be. You need to be much more patient, but this is an asset class where you will actually make money. Now. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that governments, the most patient of investors, need to create that very early stage funnel of money that goes into early stage companies because government, again, back to the story, they will take the biggest risk. Their view of investment returns is different. So if the governments want to create the next generation of entrepreneurs and economic uh, enablers, then they need to uh, find ways to either create micro funds and help uh, uh, seed those micro funds so that you create also a whole uh, new asset class skill set of people that eventually graduate to do other things in, in, in the ecosystem of investing. So uh, yes, that you need the people that are well to do also, the entrepreneurs that made it, the entrepreneurs that have understood the importance of angel investors to come and start investing. So, I'm a big fan, obviously coming from the UK, of the mechanisms that the government put in place to incentivize angel investments through tax breaks and tax incentives and et cetera. I've always advocated this and we, we've spoken about this in the Dubai committee. Um, now, obviously in some jurisdictions here in the region, there isn't tax, but I don't believe that's not a reason to create incentives. There's enough costs that can be offset. Are you a believer in that kind of mechanism to incentivize angel investors? Philip, do matching funds. Don't give me an incentive on tax because there are there is no tax here uh, in, in, in the GCC, let's say, where the biggest market is in the region. 
but give me a, a, let's do a matching fund let's say if you are a, a create a, if you, there is a network of uh, of angel investors here match them the, the best thing that you do look at singapore singapore has done massive amounts of matching yeah. funds matching funds go you want to create a micro fund of five million dollars i'll match you three to one five to one for every investment in a company that comes and sets up in singapore i'll match you five to one or four to one why don't we do that in the region i mean this is what i mean part of the incentive of of early stage companies is uh, other than needing uh, mentors and needing an infrastructure that works the, if you don't have the early stage money you're not going to have growth and and philip i must say the most important early uh, asset class is in my view at this stage is two one the angel round because if you don't have companies that uh, are getting funding very early you're not going to get growth because you won't have companies so you have to give them money so that they can start raising their a and and uh, later rounds and then there is a need also for later rounds because this region is stuck in seed and series a we don't have the big bucks for series b and we don't have a lot of angel so we need to we need to create that circle where from angel to b you are able to have a well an available funding process so that if you are if you are a company that has built a proper product if you're an entrepreneur if you built a product that works i'm not going to get you bogged down in raising money for for uh, for months and months and months and not focus on your business and i'm going to create an ecosystem where funding is available for those that are uh, uh, that have built the business that is fundable so i want to touch on this point i through magnet obviously we've continued to expand beyond mina and i've been in multiple discussions with people in southeast asia many of the things that you've just articulated are very similar to the uh, ecosystem and the development of the market there in fact one of their biggest issues that they've mentioned is a ceiling with regards to late stage investment if not exits where do you see the role of international ecosystems and investors in the cross pollination of ecosystems in supporting later stage if not acquisitions of startups to bring capital back into the ecosystem extremely essential and it has been proven so i uh, i've spent also a lot of time in singapore and that's i can tell you uh, uh, these things. I mean, I've studied other ecosystems because I'm interested in them, and I've also uh, looked at, at 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 what have they done that we haven't done here uh, in the region. But I'll tell you the biggest proof uh, that international investors will come to this region is is look at the big investors in the region uh, in the past who who have done the biggest acquisitions here. Not regional. I'm sorry yeah. to say, it's Naspers out of South Africa. It's uh, 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 Tiger Global out of New York. Uh, it is Amazon out of uh, Seattle. Uh, it basically tells you, uh, because people say, you know, the politics of the region, people don't want to invest here. I say, you know, when Amazon comes and invests 650, 680 million dollars in the region, it is making a statement. When Noon uh, and the local uh, investor community, the region investor community, uh, spend uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars to build the competitor, that means the region is an investable community, a, a, a region. And the same thing with Naspers when they came and acquired Dubizel here. I mean, they didn't talk much about it, but they actually spent four hundred million dollars doing that. So yeah. uh, that is proven. It's proven when Yahoo came comes and acquires uh, Maktoub. Uh, back in 2009, that was 11 Thompson years. Thompson Reuters, Zawiya, yeah. So, yep. so the, exactly, and Zawiya. So, uh, I don't need the case studies are there, Philip. I don't need to prove it. I, I, I'm saying, look at what happened. So, so I guess the question is, do you anticipate that that will become more common? We will continue to see this cross pollination. You bet. I'll tell you, every single company that we've invested in that has done well. And is already uh, at Series B and beyond. All the big players come and talk to them. They like yeah. size. They like size. And and these companies size means you're successful, you know, relatively. So which means you're investable. So we, the regional players, need to enable that ecosystem so that they have that size 
so that the ecosystem starts you and you recycle the money you know a lot of the exits i'll tell you the big the guys that have done look at jabbar uh, so let's look at jabbar our friends at jabbar look at what happened every time they they've done exits and they've done probably that the most successful fund in the region uh, last is uh, last of their investments is in insta shop they recycle the money in the region yep. they continue to yeah. invest they are the ecosystem builders I just want a couple of minutes left. Just two questions. One, one of the things that we saw when we just brought out the Q3 report was a complete collapse in the number of accelerator startups, because clearly we're in an environment where we cannot have uh, offline uh, accelerator programs and virtual programs are coming online, but they have a different nuance given a lot of it is to do with in-person interactions. What role do you believe accelerator programs will play in further developing the early stage pipeline? You have one that X is a perfect example and you can speak from that learning. How will that kind of develop the next 10 years worth of investable startups? I think it's extremely important. It's extremely important that these, these accelerator early stage uh, uh, pre-seed uh, accelerators actually proliferate everywhere in the region. And this is where government can actually come and partner or development agencies can come and partner with local players to enable them. Because that's where you get the mentors in one place. That's where you get the advice. That's where you give them, uh, uh, you, you get them to start their businesses at, at minimal cost. Uh, and there are many examples globally of where these uh, the best companies are actually graduating from these accelerators. So I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I don't need a McKinsey to come and study this story for me. It's already established. Just do it. You know, do it. That is it is a must. Again, this is an infrastructure play. I call it. It's not an investment play only. It's an infrastructure play. You have to build it so that you can get the companies that scale and, and, and start uh, uh, making the difference in the region. Final question. We haven't spoken about the founders themselves. How do you think that the founder mindset, the makeup of a founder will differ in five to 10 years compared to the founders that existed 10 years ago and that are starting companies to date? What do they need to be very conscious of as they start building companies in the years to come? Philip, in my view, the founders of the future and today, from today onwards, are the people that worked in the companies in the past five years in these startups. They, they, so they, they, they have the experience, they have the knowledge, they have the ideas, they have the technology, they understand the ecosystem. They are the more, the, the, the early stage founders, the Mudessers of this world, the, uh, uh, the Hussam Khouri of this world, are where are the people where all the new founders stand on their shoulders because yeah. that actually cre uh, one is created the ecosystem and then they became the role models so a more yeah. experienced generation uh, in the digital world as are going to be the future founders now uh, some of them are going to be executives in companies that leave and they have the passion to start a business yes but the founders of the future are going to be the uh, uh, Maktoub Mafia uh, graduates, if you call them, if you want to compare it to, uh, to the PayPal Mafia. PayPal, PayPal Mafia. Yeah. More importantly now, look at the Kareem. Look at the Kareem graduates. Yeah, Kareem Mafia. So many yeah. talented people are leave, uh, have left uh, uh, for various reasons and are building the future of this region. These are, and that's the essential uh, uh, message that one should say. You build companies that scale, you will get graduates of these companies that become the entrepreneurs of the future. Perfect. Fadi, as always, an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to continuing our discussion over the next 10 years we should, we to should. share the experiences of how this ecosystem grows. Absolutely. We should do one every six months and see what happens. It will be my pleasure to do that. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Fadi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.